we have been going through Philippians chapter 4 for like two years now. And the name of this series is Mindset. Check your mente, gente. Check your mind, brothers and sisters. And that's what we've been talking about lately, right? We've been talking about mindset because that's what Paul's talking about here in Philippians chapter 4. Let these things or, you know, think of these things, meditate on these things. And on chapter 2, he said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So Paul has been bringing up Philippians or has been bringing up mentality, your thinking, your mind, your thoughts over and over again in the book of Philippians. And as he's closing the chapter, as he's closing the book, as he's closing chapter 4, he says, finally, in verse 8, right? Let's pick it up. Finally, brethren, verse 8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These eight things, they're positive We are to meditate on these things. So my question for us tonight is, where has your mind been? Where are your thoughts? Where do you go? Where do you allow your mind, your thoughts to go to? Uh, Do do they go where Paul tells us we should let our minds and our thoughts go? Or do you let them go into depravity and despair and discouragement? Or perhaps even sin, compromise, sinful fantasies, uh, perhaps even to the realm of just being critical and resentful and bitter and angry and hateful. Where do you let your thoughts go? Where do you let your mind go? Wherever, whatever your mind's doing, it's going to bleed into your heart. And once those connect, then it's going to come out in your actions. It's going to come out in your words. And so that's the reason why we've, been, we've titled this series Mindset, because I want to encourage us to have biblical mindset, to have a godly mindset. And that's tough to do sometimes because our thoughts can be very powerful. Our thoughts can control us. I remember being a a teenager even, like I would allow my thoughts to go so deep in in my scheming and my planning and, uh, you know, just different things that it would actually make me start shaking. Like I'd get so angry or I'd get super anxious and I'd get super nervous. And all I did was just allow my thoughts to go there. My thoughts took me there. Some people can fall into some serious depression pending their thoughts. And some people can do some very, very sinful things pending their thoughts. And so let us be mindful of where our mind is. So like I said, check your mente, gente. Check your mind, brothers and sisters, because it's so, so important. Thus far, we've gone over whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, and then whatever things are pure. And so now we are going to go with whatever things are lovely. So here are some synonyms for the word lovely. You guys know I love words, and so since English is my second language, you guys just need to support me, amen? So whatever things are lovely, synonyms, that which is acceptable, that which is pleasing, friendly towards, Delicate, delightful, graceful, sweet, nice, admirable, amiable, and enjoyable. Hey, are those your thoughts? You know, you can tell what's coming out of your mouth. How are you treating people? And that's how you know. Antonyms, opposite of lovely, disagreeable, horrible, repulsive, undesirable, unfriendly, unpleasant, and straight up mean. Just mean. Where are your thoughts? I'm going to read a little something, something from the Psalms of Solomon. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices. Hello. Banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory. Let me say that again. (laughs) His body is carved ivory, inlaid with sapphires. 
His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. Hello, lady. <laughs> oh, oh, my man? Oh, let me describe to you my man. And so she does. But this is the part right here that, that really caught my attention, aside from everything else. <laughs> His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. Oh, you can be fine as fine can be, but what's coming out of your mouth? You can be the finest, meanest person in the world the most beautiful, meanest woman in the world. It's almost like she saves the very last part, the most important part, to the very end. Oh, his body is chiseled, and he's just like six-packing, and he's just, his legs are like perfect, and he's, you know, cheeks are like, and he smells good with this cologne, and blah, 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 blah. At the very end, his mouth is most sweet. The words that come out of his mouth are sweet. Oh, he's so sweet. That's basically what she's saying. Yes, he is altogether lovely. Yo, check it out. As a man, if my wife was to describe me, if she can go sweet and lovely, whoa, I'm doing something good. Because <laughs> that's, a, that's, a that's a hard thing, sweet and lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. I love that part. Oh, he's my love and my friend. He's so friendly. He's so sweet, the things that come out of his mouth. Hey, listen, what's coming out of your mouth? I know we focus a lot on the way we look. For a lot of us, that's very important to us. But more important than that, it needs to be the things that are coming out of our mouth. You know, this is fading. You see this right here? This is fading. It's, it's going away, you know. Everybody look at Bruce. Bruce was saying something. I, I thought maybe you wanted attention. I don't know. But, I mean, I'm fading. Bruce, I'm fading. You, you saw me when I was 15, right? I was about this tall. <laughs> and uh, that was pretty much, I mean, that's it. I mean, and so, you know, it's just I can't keep up like the way I used to. I still play basketball with a bunch of teenagers and 20-year-olds, and I could feel it. I could feel it. This is fading. But I'm hoping that when I'm 50, 60, 70, if the Lord tarries, if it's the Lord's will, that I'm still sweet. I hope that I can achieve that, that my daughters would be able to say that about me. My dad's sweet, and he is lovely. The things that come out of his mouth are beautiful things. That my wife would be able to say things like that about me. I think that would be an, I mean, what an honor for my wife, who knows me more than anyone, to be able to say that. He is sweet. The things that come out of his mouth are lovely. He is lovely to me. Gentlemen, husbands, fiancés, single people, consider what this woman is saying. Consider what the word is telling us. This word lovely comes up over and over again in the Songs of Solomon. The lady, for example, she says this about herself, I am dark but lovely. Well, what does that mean? Well, see, back then, if you were rich, if you were wealthy, then as a daughter, you didn't have to work. You could basically live the life of a princess. Never had to be outside, always inside. And if you ever went outside, you were always sheltered from the sun. So you would never get tan. You would be super, super light. And that was one of the ways that the lighter you were, that showed that you were prominent. It showed that you had, um, you know, some, some kind of clout. But if you were poor, well, everybody in the whole family had to jump in and do their part and try to earn a living. And so that meant that the kids had to go into the fields and work. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but f working in the fields is a very difficult job. Now, some of you guys may, may remember doing that as children, that when you were young, that was something that you had to do. I know my, my wife's family, you know, when the Dust Bowl was happening, they immigrated to California and they were picking cotton and vegetables and strawberries, everything. And it was one of those things that was a hard thing. You were in the elements, and you would get dark. You would get tan because you're in the sun all day. And so basically what this lady is saying is, I am poor, but I'm lovely. I don't have money, 
I don't have clout. I don't have a title. I don't, I don't come from a wealthy family. I have nothing to give except this, that I'm lovely, that I'm friendly. Now, this word lovely means agreeable. I may not be beautiful, but I'm agreeable. I may not be beautiful on the outside, but I'm beautiful on the inside, and that's much more important anyways. It means suitable, pleasant, nice, delightful, sweet. I may not have anything, but what I do have is this, I'm lovely. And no wonder the king fell in love with this field worker. The opposite of this word lovely, disagreeable. Now, in arguments, what happens? A disagreement. If you're always disagreeable, if you're always disagreeing, you're probably almost always fighting then, always arguing. This lady was lovely, not disagreeable. Another antonym for this word lovely, repellent. Ugh, I don't even want to be around you. Just every time I'm around you, it's just like, uh, it's always negative, it's always a fight, it's always drama, it's always something. And I just, people just don't want to hang out with you because you're drama. People don't want to hang out with you because it's always something. Always some complaint, some something, anything. But it repels people. It causes people to just not want to be with you. And unfortunately, divorce is a form of repellent. Another word, Another antonym for this word lovely is offensive. Offensive. Just being offensive. Unattractive. Not in the physical sense, but in personality. Your personality is unattractive. And then the last word, revolting. I don't want to be any of those. And this lady, this poor lady, this lady that had to work hard in the fields, who wasn't poor, or I mean who was poor, who wasn't rich, she was dark, she was poor, but she was lovely. She had what mattered most. It is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious, brawling, strife wife. <laughs> and the exact same wording is said twice in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 21, verse 9, and then Proverbs 25, verse 24. I like this version. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Hey, that's great. You got everything. Too bad you have a quarrelsome wife. Man, it's better just to live in an attic. I'll go up in the attic, play with my records. And when you want to see you, I'm repelled by your attitude. You're unattractive to me because you're not lovely. It goes on to say, it is better to live alone in the desert. Okay, now in those days, if you went alone in the desert, you're basically dead. <laughs> so in a way, what they're saying, it's better to be dead than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. So it's better to live alone in the desert. A quarrelsome wife is as annoying as a constant dripping on a rainy day. Ay, ay, ay. A fool's lips bring strife, and his mouth calls for blows. Because sometimes those guys can be mean, we can be insensitive, we can take our jokes, our sarcasm, to pass the line of sin and begin to be offensive. And we already know a lot of sarcasm, there's a grain of truth in it. So we say it in a joking kind of manner, because we're trying to say it. We're trying to get it across. And then we'll like wrap it up with, I'm just kidding. And then we'll lie. No, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah, you did. But a fool's lips bring strife. Husbands, single men, young men, what's coming out of your mouth? Is it foolishness? And his mouth calls for blows. Dude, you're always getting into fights. Why? <laughs> well, I said this. Oh, that's why. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. What's coming out of your mouth? You know, law enforcement, 
One of the reasons why they're professionals is because they're taught how to calm a situation down. That's why a lot of people that try to be police officers don't make it because they're hot-tempered. They find out through tests and just different situations, oh, you're a snappy, snapper kind of person. That's me, by the way. So I'm going to be a pastor instead. (laughs) But a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, stirs up strife. Just can't stay quiet. You got to say something. You got to say the last word. No, you know what? I'm going to manhandle the situation right now, and I'm just going to say my piece. I'm going to say my part because, you know what? I'm sick of it. Or you're not going to hurt me. I'm not going to belittle me or make me feel like I'm weak. I'm not going to. I refuse to turn the other cheek. I refuse to be my, like my Lord and Savior, who when they were talking about him and saying all kinds of stuff and even spitting in his, in his face and pulling his beard and socking him in the face and in the body and all this and all that, didn't say one single word. I refuse to be like my Lord and Savior because I'm a man. And so I'm going to manhandle things. Anyone who loves to quarrel loves sin. Anyone who speaks boastfully or builds up defenses invites disaster. Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Powerful Proverbs. Through insolence, rude, disrespectful behavior comes nothing but strife, But wisdom is for those who receive counsel. And God's constantly counseling us. It's called conviction. Holy Spirit counsels us. Hey, stop saying that. Stop being mean. Stop being rude. Stop being boastful. Stop being arrogant. Stop being so sensitive. Stop. And when we refuse to change, when we refuse to repent, when we refuse, then we don't take counsel. We're not taking counsel. Counsel. But if we want to be wise, in other words, if I'm a person that's hot-tempered, if I'm a person that's sensitive, if I'm a person that snaps, if I receive God's counsel, I can become wise. Wise enough to learn how not to be hot-tempered. Wise enough to learn not to snap and to be so sensitive. You see what I mean? God constantly gives counsel Are we taking it or are we not? The word of God is the counsel of God. Are we reading it? Are we receiving it? If you know that you struggle with anger, you know that you struggle with lust, you know you struggle with something, are you seeking counsel? Are you seeking the the word of God? Are you seeking the spirit of God? Are you seeking, you know, brothers and sisters who love God, asking them to hold you accountable? Hey, how did you overcome? What does the Bible say about it? And then are you applying it to your life and receiving that counsel so that you don't become or continue being a fool? Because that's basically what the Bible is saying, that those who refuse counsel are fools. It's foolish. Don't be like the ones who devise evil things in their hearts. They continually stir up wars. Hey, I want to be a peacemaker because that's what my Jesus was. Right? He came as a peacemaker not to create wars. And so what am I? Am I a peacemaker or do I like bringing war? Do I like causing war? A man of great wrath, in other words, a man that has a temper problem, will suffer punishment. For if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. Why? Because they refuse to learn. They refuse to receive the counsel. Here we go again. You're in trouble again. I'm bailing you out again. I'm having to quench this problem that you started again. Why? Because you didn't learn your last time. And we got to be the kind of people that learn from our mistakes. Amen? Amen. God is gracious. He's compassionate. He's loving. He's caring. And trust me, I've many a times have not learned from my mistakes. And finally got to the point where I was hurting so much and so deep that I was forced to repent. Or else there was going to be a break in the relationship. There was going to be a division within the relationship. The relationship's going to end if I don't repent. And I was so stubborn that I thought that I was right. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. And that's just Paul warning us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 15. 
all he's saying is if you just want to keep arguing, you want to keep fighting, and you want to just keep devouring one another, you're going to consume each other. You're going to kill each other. You're going to end your guys' relationship. And in this case, you're going to end the existence of their church. So be lovely. Be acceptable. Be pleasing. Be friendly towards. Be delicate. Be delightful. Be graceful. Be sweet, nice, admirable, amiable, and enjoyable. Don't be disagreeable. Don't be horrible. Don't be repulsive, undesirable. Don't be rude and disrespectful, unfriendly, unpleasant. Don't be mean. Don't be mean. Again, wherever your thoughts are is going to lead your words and your actions. So obviously it starts in your mind. Where are your thoughts? Where is your mind? Where do you take it? Where do you let the Lord take it? Or do you let the enemy take it? Or do you just control it yourself and, well... Lead it to wherever. How lovely life can be if one takes time to be friendly. If you want friends, be friendly. If you don't have friends, it's because you're not friendly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's as simple as that. It's basic sociology. Secular sociology teaches. You want to be friendly or you want to, be, you want to have friends, be friendly. Most likely... In fact, it's almost a for sure thing that the reason why you don't have friends is because you're not friendly. Don't wait for people to be friendly. Show them how. I like that. You take the initiative. Well, no one comes and talks to me. Well, then you go talk to them. Now yeah, everybody ignores me. Well, you don't ignore them. You show them how to be friendly. You set the example. Or people will be like, yeah, you know what, man? Our church, it's like... Sometimes we just be so, well, then you know what? Set the example, dog. Set the example, homie. Set the example, brother and sister. Set the example. Help me change things around. Let's not just complain. Let's change things around. Instead of complaining, let us pray. Let us pray that God comes upon us and that he causes us to mature and to grow together in love and in maturity and in the word. Be the reason someone smiles today. That's pretty cool. Simple, simple stuff. Today, make people smile. That's it. That's all you have to do. I already made most of you smile, so that's good. I'm, I'm on a roll right now, praise the Lord. <laughs> but seriously, that's what we're supposed to do. It's like every day, I'm going to make my wife smile. I know how to make her frown. That's easy. <laughs> Super easy. All I have to do is ignore her. That's all I have to do. All I have to do is criticize her. All I have to do is walk into the ass and go, Wow. All right, then. That's all I have to say. All I have to do is look at dinner and go, you know. I mean, I could just do all those things that I can make her frown, but can I make her smile? Can I make my wife, who I've been with for 19 years, can I still make her smile? You guys that have been married for a long time, can you make your spouse smile still? I hope so. But what a good, simple little task. Whoever you're around, make them smile. Be friendly. Be delicate. Be kind. Be nice. There is no more lovely, friendly, and charming relationship, communion, or company than a good marriage. Tell you what, if your purpose is to make each other smile, you're going to have a good marriage. And past marriage, just our relationships here at church, we're going to have a good church. If all of us come in with the point and the vision and the heart to make each other smile. Oh, not just my friends, quote unquote, everyone. I want to put a smile in your face. I want to be encouraging. I want to be lovely. I want to be pleasant. I want to be delightful. I want to be your friend. I want you to be my friend. But I know that that part of me has... Okay, well, if I want you to be my friends, I must be friendly to you and vice versa. I love what this businessman said. He said, I forgot to shake hands and be friendly. It was an important lesson about leadership. This guy was a multi-millionaire, successful CEO. And he said that he got so business-oriented. He got so like, it's all about the, the policy. It's all about business, the bottom dollar, the profit. 
that he forgot how to be friendly to the people that worked for him. He forgot how to shake their hands. He forgot how to be nice to them. He began to take advantage of them. And he just thought, man, that was, a, that was a hard lesson for me in leadership. Hey, for us who are in leadership, or for any of us that want to be in leadership, if we forget to shake hands and be friendly, then we probably shouldn't be in leadership. As leaders, and I really don't want to use that word very much because it's not really in the Bible, but the word servant is, and that's really what a leader is, someone who's just willing to serve. And as servants, one, it's a great privilege. I mean, two, it's a token to God's grace, mercy, and love. But when it comes down to it, primarily what we're called to do is to love one another. And you guys have seen our, our little like logo slogan that we have, Calvary Chapel, CCAG, love God, love people. It doesn't say saved people. It doesn't say my people. It doesn't say brown people. It says people, period. All people. I forgot to shake hands and be friendly. It was an important lesson about leadership, he said. Mm, very important. So then we go to the next one. Whatever things are of good report. What does that mean, good report? Things that are reputable, admirable, well spoken of, uttering words of good omen, sounding well, speaking auspiciously, conducive to success, favorably, encouraging, inspiring hope, upbeat, heartening, cheering, positive. Do you guys notice my voice was going up? <laughs> Just trying to be positive and encouraging, that's all. Could you imagine? All right, so this word, good report. favorably, encouraging. Like, I mean, come on. But sometimes that's the way we come across sometimes. Let's be careful with that. Whatever things are of good report, here are the antonyms, doubtful, dubious, grim, negative, pessimistic, bleak, depressing, desperate, discouraging, disheartening, downbeat, Dreary, gloomy, hopeless, unpromising. Who wants to be around that? If you're that kind of a person, who's going to want to be around you? You know, one of the things that we taught the high school kids, because there was this phase, it was the emo stage. You guys remember that? Man, and it's still there. I mean, but I had to come up with the quick slogan to help us, quote unquote not be so emo. <laughs> so, you guys remember this, I love it. And it was simple, super like grammatically correct. Me, no, emo, <laughs> simple. Me, no, emo, we refuse to be emo. To a certain degree, it, it's almost an oxymoron to be an emo Christian. But Christianity is hope, love, joy. Emo is darkness. <laughs> Don't, it's depressing. It's, my life is hurting. My life is hurting. And those are the wannabes, but there are some that really do struggle with that, like for reals. And for those people, where is your mind at? For those of you that really do struggle with depression, I'm, I'm talking like the enemy is able to use depression in a way where it, it's demonic, it's oppression. Where is your mind? It's almost like you have to steal your mind. In other words, your mind has to be strong. You have to make your thoughts strong. The only way you're going to do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit. I read the word of God. I read the promises. And I pray that these promises would be my anchor, Lord God. I need divine assistance. I need help. And so for us who really do struggle with depression, and for us who really do struggle with being gloomy, 
and dreary, and we always are pessimistic. I would love for you to come up to me so that we could talk. Let me help you through this. Let me see what we could do for you. At the very least, we're going to ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon you, and then we're going to sit down and find out what it is that, that's causing this. What are the triggers? Why is this happening? I just want to encourage you to come on up. Do you guys remember Charlie Brown and Snoopy? Here's Charlie Brown. Someday we will all die, Snoopy. This is Snoopy, the talking dog. True. But on all the other days, we will not. (laughs) Right on, Snoopy. Snoop Dogg in the house. Can I get an amen? You could be that person that focuses on that one day that you're going to die, or you could be like Snoopy and be like, yeah, but what about the rest of the days? Let's live, man. Let's live until we die. That's basically the moral of the story here. Let's live till the Lord calls us home. Hey, like Brother Billy Graham. Man, 99 years old. Can I get an amen? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That man lived... Till he died. That's what I'm talking about. He wasn't waiting for death to come. He was just, hey, as the Lord. He was waiting for the rapture. If, you had, if he was waiting for anything, he was waiting for the rapture. But I guess death will do because I just graduated. Now I'm face to face with my lover of my soul. The one who created me. The one who forgave me. And in his mighty grace used me. What a blessed man he is. The pessimist finds fault. So if you're constantly finding fault in people, you're pessimistic. If in your marriage, you're always able to bring up the bad things all the time, you're just, I mean, astute command of the faults, you're pessimistic. We have been called to be optimistic. So the pessimist finds fault, but the optimist discovers a remedy. So I would come home and the house wasn't as clean as I demanded it lovingly, demanded it to be. And I would come in and I would just start sighing. (sighs) And my wife, who knows me, was like, what's wrong? And I would lie to her, nothing, I'm just breathing. (laughs) That was a lie. Really what was going on is I'm really frustrated with you right now because I left you at 8 o'clock in the morning and now it's 4 p.m., and the house is still a mess. What in the world is going on here? Do I need to fire you? Do I need to, what do we need to do here? That's really what was going on in my mind, because I'm so lovely. So, of course, I mean, that always led to arguments. It led to, you know, me hurting my wife, and just me being mean, and all that stuff. And then it started stumbling me like really stumbling me and just like I began to get angry, really angry, almost like just kind of critical towards my wife and even my kids. And I would come in, I'd just start throwing a fit basically. And then the Lord's like, why don't you clean the house? (laughs) That's not my job. (laughs) Okay. What is your job? Oh, yeah, to love my wife. Obviously, she needs help. Obviously, you haven't asked her, what kind of a day have you had? You're just coming in, and you're already assuming, and you're judging without asking and talking. And you know what? And it took a little bit of time, but now I'm free from that. Come in, the house is dirty. Praise the Lord, my family's alive. (laughs) Family's alive, and the house didn't burn down. Praise Jesus, we're good. Seriously, I walk in this morning, or this after work, 4 o'clock, I open the door, smoke everywhere. <laughs> Why is there smoke in the house? And then Jenny's like, oh, I was cooking a pancake. <laughs> Ow. Did you forget about the pancake? I mean, what happened? <laughs> She's like, what, Dad? It was a pancake. I go, Maybe you have the flame too high. Dad, it was a pancake. Yeah, whatever. Anyways, I just opened the doors and just thank God the house didn't burn down. Thank you, Jesus, for taking me through that journey, I tell you. The pessimist seeks sympathy. The optimist spreads cheer. They call them fun suckers. 
oh, here they come. Here they come. And they come, and it's never, hey, what's up? God is good. It's always, yeah. So anyways, this happened, and so it's just like, oh, man, man. And I get it. Sometimes that happens, right? I get it. That, that happens. You know, and as a pastor, like, hey, that's my job. My job is, hey, you come to me when you're having, like, a bad day. You're having a bad time. You're having a rough time in your life. But as a pastor, this is what I'm hoping to see, that you get out of that and that you grow. Because what I'm going to tell you is, well, let's go to the Lord. Let's go to the greatest counselor in the entire galaxy, the entire universe. You can go to counselors, you can go to pastors all you want, but the Bible calls God mighty counselor. How about this? Read the word of God every day. How about one proverb, one proverb, one one chapter a day? And then fast and pray. And let's see what God does. Not let's see if God comes through. No, let's see what God does. How about you humble yourself? How about you just forgive How about you just let it go and let God, and let's see what God does. And as a pastor, when I say that to you, when I say that to people, I know God's going to come through. So when they constantly, over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and it's like that, over and 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 over again, they keep coming with the same, you know, what was me and injustice and murmuring and complaining, then I have to question your side, your part of your relationship with God. Because I know God's there ready to deliver and to empower you and to use it for growth and maturity. But you're not letting that happen. So I've got to find out what's going on. The pessimist criticizes circumstances. The optimist changes conditions. The pessimist complains about the apple seeds. The optimist plants them. The pessimist imagines impending peril. The world's going to end. It's over. Society is going to. And we already know. The book of Revelation already says that. But everyone's just like, oh, no, it's impending peril. But the optimist sees signs of prosperity. While people are afraid that the world is going to end. You know the way I see it? Jesus is coming back soon. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Amen. Because Jesus promised that. He said things were going to get worse before I come. Okay. So this is a good thing that things are getting worse. In a weird kind of a way, we can actually rejoice in that, that things are getting worse. Because our salvation draws near. The pessimist disparages. The optimist encourages. The pessimist creates loneliness. The optimist finds friends. The pessimist nibbles at the negative. The optimist is nourished by the positive. I love that. Let me just close with this. Winston Churchill, a man that knows a little bit about crazy and tough situations and pressure, and I don't know if we're going to make it. It could be literally the end of the world, said this. A pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. The only way we can make it is by knowing that God's in control. The only way we can make it is knowing that God is God and he is faithful to his word and his promises and to us as children. And all we have to do is believe in him. That's all you have to do, just believe him and step out in faith and in obedience. You do that and watch God move in you and through you. But if you fight and you rebel and you reject, well, what do you expect? Humble yourself under God's mighty hand and let's see what he does through you. Amen? Amen. So Father, we come before you and we just thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you that you save us. Thank you, Lord God, that you're cleansing us. You've forgiven us of our sins. Thank you that we have hope we could be excited, that we could rejoice even as things are spiraling out of control. As we see the enemy 
gain more and more influence over the world. Things are getting more and more dark and desperate. And I refuse to fear that, Lord God. If anything, I choose to look to you even more and to call upon you even more and to worship you even more and to deny myself even more and to be in your word and to grasp your promises even more, to believe like never before. That's what I choose to do, Lord. And you will hold me up. You will lift me up. You will empower me. You will come upon me. And so we thank you, Lord God, that you bless us and that you give us that joy and that hope. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.